to the cloud. I'm sure you all heard that too. All right, welcome everybody. It's so good to see all your faces. This is our um, January meeting and I'm gonna share my screen, go back to sharing my screen here. And we're gonna ask that you use the chat box to ask any questions or to make any announcements you wanna make and I'll be monitoring the chat and hopefully getting back to people. And then during the discussion, if you could use your reaction button um, where you can raise your hand and it's usually in your toolbar, you can find your raise hand reaction button and that would be really helpful. So getting started, let's see here. Bear with me here, it's giving me hit. All right, so we're gonna start with our land acknowledgement and um, go through that piece, the land acknowledgement that we are on the unceded lands of the Spokane tribes. And we'd like to do a land acknowledgement with every meeting to make sure that we are paying tribute to... Oh, I'm gonna ask people to mute um, if they're not already muted so that uh, you're not interrupting the meeting. That'd be great. Thank you. And then we wanna look at land acknowledgement and- And I can't hear. Uh-oh. We wanna look at land acknowledgement um, and diversity, equity, inclusion as one um, lens that we're gonna, well, as a complex lens that we look at. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on this. So when we're talking tonight about our program of work and the things that we decide that we want to do as a league and how we want to move forward with different items, we want to make sure to ask that you are looking at this um, through the DEI lens of what it means to examine your work through the DEI lens. So hopefully you all can see my screen. This is a um, website that I'm going to post in the chat when I get done here. And this will tell you all about um, how to think about anything that we do in the League for DEI Lens. You wanna ask yourself who is involved in the process? Are the key stakeholders meaningfully included? Is the impact, um, is the work impacting a group or community? And if so, is their voice represented? Are we representing everybody that needs to be at the table? How diverse is the group of decision makers? You wanna ask yourself who will be impacted? Who benefits from this? Who is burdened by this? Does this help us meet the needs of underserved voters? And have we considered various specific marginalized groups and how they might be impacted? What are the intended and unintended outcomes? So we wanna be able to look at it from a big picture and say, what are we trying to solve and what are the um, downstream effects that may come from this? And then does this align with our vision for an equitable and inclusive organization? What barriers might this place in the way of achieving equity? And how does this impact the league's culture? And then what changes could be made to make this more equi equitable? So you wanna look at whatever it is that you're trying to do and ask yourself, how can we make sure to include all the voices? Um, what are our short-term goals? What are our long-term goals? and um, benefits for members. These are all really good questions. So I'm going to post this. I'm trying not to make anybody dizzy by scrolling too fast. So I'm gonna post this link so that if you decide that you wanna do any program of work or you wanna put forward any studies after listening to the presentations tonight, that you make sure and consult this page and ask yourself these questions as you're moving forward. So let me stop sharing so that I can get that into the chat for you all here. There we go. All right, so hopefully you can all see that in the chat, okay? Oops. I gotta go back to my PowerPoint here. So bear with me one second. And I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so next, next on our agenda 
is I want to turn the, um, the well, I don't know what, Zoom. It's been a while. I've been doing hybrid for so long that all of a sudden I'm stumbling on my words. <laughs> um, it's been a while since we did just a Zoom meeting only. So I'm going to turn this over to Lynn McGinn. And Lynn is going to give us, um, just have a conversation and um, have a little something to say for all of us at the league. Good evening. It's nice that all of you have joined us. Can you hear me okay? Great. Just so you, you, if you haven't met me, my name is Lynn McGinn and I've been a part of the League of Women Voters leadership team this year. I was born and raised here in Spokane and I was in Seattle years ago at the UW and joined in the late 1970s. And in 1983, my husband and I moved back to Spokane and in, when my children were in uh, junior high, I went back to league here in Spokane. We've raised two children and now I have three grandchildren and one of my children, grandchildren is just 10 days old. So I'm at my daughter's house by, right now. Um, last Saturday, I attended a Zoom meeting of the Speak Up School sponsored by our state league. And in the discussion, the women shared that they were concerned about the healthcare system and the, deni the denial in the state government among officials and the governor saying that we were finished with COVID and we're not out of the crisis yet, is what these women, this woman said. That one was a nurse, uh, and she said that we are still in crisis with the pandemic, and our healthcare systems are unable to handle the influx of people needing help with medical and medical health, uh, mental health. We are all overwhelmed in our communities, and our work, in our families. And if only we share among ourselves uh, how we are coping and see the overwhelming grief, hostility and anger that is prevalent in our midst. We are living in extraordinary times. Even our mother earth is in an existential crisis for our very existence. The League is under attack from the Republican Party for doing such a great job in registering voters. <laughs> And we must look within and manage ourselves about our organization. I have asked that we please be kind to each other in other meetings. The pandemic has created chaos in our public and personal relationships. We at the League of Women Voters in Spokane need to take note of what we are doing and how we talk to each other, how we interact with League, our League, and outside of our organization to friends, families, and family members, and outside relationships in the public realm. We need to respect each other. To keep our issues among ourselves inside the League of Women Voters and quell anything in conversation to others and solve dis any discord among ourselves. Speak kindly to each other. We need to find the tools to be more effective in our conversation and have care in how we talk about the league to those outside of our organization. I have advocated that we have a book club and read books together. And as a young nurse in the 1970s, I read a book called I'm Okay and You're Okay and attended workshops in my workplace. And this was great help to myself. I was able to use this tool to help myself take better care of my inner child and use the tool to uh, restrain my critical parent and create a more nurturing parent in myself and work effectively as an adult in my working and personal relationships. Another book that gives help with these matters is The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. The agreements are, be impeccable with your word, don't take anything personally, don't make assumptions, and always do your best. The League started in the 1920s in uncertain times. In 1918, there was a flu epidemic and, and World War II ended in 1918, just about like now. And on the national website, 
we can find this statement. We believe in the power of women to create a more perfect democracy that's been our vision since 1920, when the League of Women Voters was founded by leaders of women's suffrage movement. For 100 years, we have been a nonpartisan, activist, grassroots organization that believes voters should play a critical role in democracy. The League has celebrated 100 years in Washington State, and we are about to celebrate 75 years here in Spokane. My intention, and I hope you will join me, is to move forward in these endeavors, and we need all of us to succeed. I will endeavor to nurture others with knowledge and skill, to empower others in our membership, as well as to learn and teach new skills. Recently, the last couple of days in a conversation with my daughter, she, she gave me this quote. She said, what kind of people do you want to be? It's your choice. The ones that complain or the ones that get things done. I wanna thank you for your attention this evening. Wish you a happy new year. And we are off into 2000, a challenging 2023 new year. Good evening. Okay, thank you, Lynn. I really appreciate that. Okay, so now next we're gonna move on to Sylvia Oliver. And Sylvia is going to be talking to us about our program of work and other league information that's very important as soon as I bring up this PowerPoint again. Let's see if I can find it. There we go. So let me share my slideshow. It's thinking. Okay. All right, Sylvia. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to hand it off to you. And you have to unmute that darn unmute button. There we go. That helps. So <laughs> um, I want to uh, welcome everybody to our general meeting tonight. Um, it's it's going to be uh, especially interesting in the second half because we're going to be uh, having some special guests talk about a league study, the decline of local news. And um, next slide. So this is just a, an overview of the meeting tonight. The uh, first part of the meeting, I'm going to be talking about program planning process, kind of a, a bird's eye view of that and how we move from idea to action. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit, just to give a brief overview of our standing committees and how, how people can get involved in our league. And then for the second half of the uh, meeting tonight, we're going to hear from our guests from uh, the State League on the decline of local news. I'm really excited about uh, listening to that one, read that study. Um, it, it was very depressing to me. <laughs> So it's going to be really interesting to see how we're going to um, use that study, move into consensus process. Um, and I think that, I mean, uh, the what I'm going to be talking about tonight, uh, the program planning process, um, because we have longtime leaguers here that have been in the league for decades. And so this is just, this is just part of who they are. They just understand it so well. And I still am learning about the program planning process and all of the intricacies uh, involved in this. And so uh, for those who know all about the program planning process, this will just, you know, you, you know all of the pieces and parts to that. Please, if, if there is anything that you wanna add, feel free to add as I am moving through my, uh, my presentation to, uh, to add, you know, special pieces that you think need to be added. I, I would really appreciate that. Uh, so next slide, please. So the league has two major kinds of work. We have voter services and we have program of work. And voter services is the one that 
uh, the part of the league that most people understand and uh, you know the the league's name is associated with next slide please so uh, they uh, the voter surfaces uh, part of our league does so many things and we have Becky Dickerhoof is uh, with us tonight she's the chair of this and so she has all of these things that she's overseeing and like I said this is this is the the face of the league in the community um, and the, the voter registration, we do voter registrations throughout, throughout the year. And even in the dead of winter, we did voter registration. I think a great model is that we typically do uh, voter registration at naturalization ceremonies. Those are typically done at the courthouse. But this last month, they did the voter registration at Ferris High School, one of our largest high schools in the Spokane area a fabulous model because then the students can see these, um, these new citizens that come from all over the world who have made sacrifices to come to the United States and become citizens. And then we have a table and register them to vote as soon as they become new citizens. It's just, it's just a really wonderful um, uh, event to be part of. We do voter education throughout the year. Uh, that can be um, that we we do, we are part of nonprofit organizations, work with other nonprofit organizations, community events where we hand out materials, register people to vote. We put materials in food boxes that uh, Second Harvest Food uh, sends out. So we do lots, lots of different things with voter education. We do get out the vote. That's primarily related to when the primary and general elections come around. We have been doing candidate forms forever. Uh, the league is well known and very well respected for our candidate forms. Um, in the day, they were all face to face. Uh, some of those in um, the city council chambers downtown uh, moved to online uh, totally during the pandemic, and then a hybrid this last uh, the last primary and general elections, and then we post those online, uh, or uh, we have a YouTube channel so uh, people can go to those and visit those and see our candidate forums. We do vote411.org, which is a uh, national program, and people can go to that website and find detailed information about all of the candidates. Uh, we have a guide to elected officials that we do every year. We call it the, They Represent You, it's the TRI. Uh, we have that posted on our website, lwvspokane.org. So if anybody is interested in any of the details about elected officials, and that's, that's local, regional, state, and national. They can go to the try and see that. And then we have other uh, activities as well under voter services. We have a very active civics education group and that is uh, organized by Beth Pelicciotti. And they have been going into all of the high schools in Spokane Public Schools. That's the largest school district. Uh, in Spokane, they have about 33,000 students, but we go to the five major high schools and they, they have an alternative high school. Let's go into the civics classrooms. They have a, um, uh, a PowerPoint that they on voter, the history of voter uh, voting rights and the importance of voting. And then they register high school students to vote. And the, uh, they register hundreds of high school students. It's exact, and in the state of Washington, uh, which is a leader in the nation on voting rights, they, we can register 16, 17, and 18-year-old students to vote. Uh, and then they get their first ballot when they turn 18. And then we have a civics bowl that was started last year in collaboration with our local PBS news station, KSPS. Um, and that received national recognition. And they, that will occur again this year. They have been uh, very busy writing up all of the uh, questions for the high school students. Again, it will involve all of the uh, high schools in District 81. And this year, we have Central Valley School District, which is the second largest school district in our region. They will be joining. And then one of the smallest school districts is called Liberty. And that's out by Spangle. Um, where they have hundreds of students instead of thousands of students. So we're really excited about that. And you'll be, you can uh, get information about that uh, through our website again, lwvspokane.org. Next slide, please. 
at the next slide. April. <laughs> I'm here. It's okay. stuck. Hold on. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> there we go. I kept clicking next and it wasn't doing anything. Okay, there you go. <laughs> okay. Um, and so the 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 kind of next big bucket of, of what the league does is called program of work. And uh, you know, I tell the when people ask about the league, I say it's like an onion. I mean, you just keep peeling back layers and layers and layers, and it just goes so deep. And this program of work, I was in fact talking to my son this afternoon about it and trying to explain all of the moving parts of our program of work. And this, this is where we go from idea, and it's just so grassroots. It goes from idea, it could be a member or a group or a committee, and they find something of importance to, uh, that they feel is of importance to their community. And, then it eventually, through this, this well-bedded process, comes down to action. And action is our, uh, you know, what we do in the community. And it is this process that sets the league apart from other organizations, absolutely, in my mind. See, because, because other organizations that we even we work with in our communities, um, you know, have the same focus. So like they're working on housing and homelessness or they're working on smart justice or uh, DEI issues in the community. But the league, whenever we do something in the public or we have action, making testimonies, writing letters, it's all based on this foundation of deep work that we have done previously. And that's why we're so well respected regionally and at the state level and national, because anybody that is impacted, let's say it's in the government making decisions, they know we have done our work and that what we are presenting is, is based on a really solid foundation. And so I'm going to go through the steps of that. How do we get in our league from idea then to study to creating a position, and then we can base our actions on the position. Next slide, please. So um, from idea to study to action. And uh, so the process is can take years to do. And we have perfect examples. I'm so excited. We have perfect examples. We have the Shoreline Management Act study and now the decline of local news study. These, the, and this, so, so we see it in action. And I go back to the, the, what I call the long leaguers, okay? The people that have been in the league for, for you know, decades because they, they were part of that process. And we haven't had something like this for the newbies like me to really see how it works. And so they, um, I created this to, to explain how each of the steps works from the idea. So at the very beginning on the study of the issues, you identify an issue that, that can impact governmental change, like a public policy issue. And you do, a bit of background work to say um, how does it uh, how how would your study impact your community and do we already have a league position on this particular let's say on water quality I'm just going to use an example of water quality um, so do we have a position on water quality, and is it updated enough? Do we need new information about that issue of water quality in our area? And once again, does it affect uh, governmental change or can that affect governmental change? Um, then once again, now, and what we had said at the beginning with the DEI lens, how, does the, how can we use the DEI lens when we're uh, looking at this particular issue? what communities are impacted, how are they impacted? Are we including those voices when we're uh, looking at doing, uh, studying this particular issue? Um, and 
do the importantly is does the league have the resources to do the study do we have volunteers that are committed to doing this sometimes these um these studies uh take years to complete a uh, perfect example i think is thurston county over on the coast they are just completing two studies one on tribal issues and one on water quality and both of these took several years to complete. So they needed to have a committed group of people to do those studies. And uh, so they, you, you have this idea and then you have to present this to the leadership, to the board of either uh, locally or at the state or you present it to the national. And then that is discussed and, and vetted and approved to move forward to then do the study uh, for what you're looking at for your public policy issue. And then you conduct the study and you gather the fact. They have to be, it has to be accurate. All of the information has to be accurate and unbiased. Again, we're using our nonpartisan lens here as well. And my background is academia. I was born, raised, and spent my career in academia. And I liken this process to doing almost like a master's thesis. It is that in-depth. These studies are that in-depth. So then you complete the study, but then as this is a grassroots process, it has to be vetted by the membership, reviewed, and then we go through a consensus process. So uh, and we, we were part of the Shoreline Management Act study consensus process. So we had members that read the study in depth, and then we all got together and there were consensus questions, certain questions that the, that the study group wanted to have answered so that that would lead then to eventually position statements. So, and they have to present the pros and cons as well. So membership can look at that and say, is it, uh, is this valid or is it not valid? And how do I feel about that? And the consensus process and the questions asked are, are typically on a Likert scale of one to five. I totally agree. I totally don't agree. And then in the middle we have, it doesn't make, uh, I, it doesn't make any difference either way to me. And then the consensus questions from different groups then are consolidated. And then those then result in a position statement. And uh, then, oh, there it is. <laughs> so then we have these position statements and then we can act on those. So we can act to affect governmental change based on positions derived through many member study and agreement. So you can see it's a long-term process and it's, it's, it's in-depth and it's, to me, it's complicated, but it is just so uh, to the heart of what the league does. Uh, next slide, please. Again, if anybody has any questions, please raise your hand and uh, we uh, at, at any point in time. Um, so then the, we have the program of work and I was talking about the end result is action. So what are those actions? What do we mean by action? You can testify uh, uh, let's say the city council has is talking about housing and homelessness, you can testify in the name of the league based on position statements, either locally at the state or at the national level. You can write letters to the editor in the name of the league. You can write opinion pieces. You can participate in workshops in the name of the league. And all of those things also have to be approved at the board level. So if you want to testify, in a, at, at the city council, you present that to the board, your testimony, and then the board can approve that, then then you can testify in the name of the league. Um, and then of course, a perfect example, and right now with a legislative session starting are the lobby team efforts. And all the lobby team efforts are all based on position statements that have been based on studies that were that started perhaps by a single member with, a, with an idea. And so I think we all have to take that to heart uh, that if we want to make an impact on our community, we can actually present those things to the league, to your local league or to the state league. Um, once again, that has to receive board approval um, 
uh, as as you go. So if you want to make if you wanted to present something at the state level, you'd have to get board approval to be able to do that. Um, next slide, please. So um, the I my my son asked. I think this is really good. Anyway, he says, so he asked. He said, well, what is a position statement? So uh, in, even though I am not supposed to read off of a PowerPoint slide, I'm going to read off of this PowerPoint slide. And it's a position statement is a statement of the league's point of view on an issue arrived at through member study and agreement, consensus or concurrence, approved by the appropriate board, and used as a basis for league action. And so I thought it would be great to have a specific example of a position statement. Uh, so next slide, please. Well, actually, before that, I wanted I wanted to uh, to show for for the league for our league for the Spokane area league. I wanted to show the the heading the major headings and the subheadings for our position statements for our league, and all of these were based on studies that were conducted sometimes many years ago. So we have our major headings of natural resources, social policy, local government, and then under those are the subheadings. And then under each of the subheadings, we have position statements. So you can imagine the amount of work that was done to, to get us to this point. And the other thing that I think is just really amazing is that some of these position statements were based on studies that were done decades ago. And they were done so well. And they are they, and they're broad enough that, that we can use them still today for doing good work in our community. So the next slide is, a, is an example of a specific position statement that you can find uh, in our handbook. And it is under natural resources, which then falls under air and water pollution. And then it's specifically related to our aquifer. And so our position statement is support aggressive action to achieve governmental policy, which will provide maximum protection to the Spokane Valley Rathrum Prairie Aquifer which is critical to our area. That's where we get all our water. So this position statement, uh, that if we, if we don't have the issue now, maybe in five years, there's gonna be a critical issue uh, related to the aquifer. And we can fall back on this position statement then to take action in our community. So next slide, please. And once again, I said, I'm just so excited that <laughs> <laughs> that we have these very specific examples right now and work that has taken years and years to complete through the, the initial idea that was presented to the board that was, or to, uh, to the board, to the state, and then uh, a convention approved for uh, the studies to be completed. And once again, we're very fortunate to be able to then have the state come in and uh, guide us through the decline of local news study tonight. Next slide, please. Oh, that didn't work out really well, did it? Oh, well. So we have the, the, our standing committees, and we have three active standing committees. And each of these standing committees does good work in the community. And the good work in the community is based on the position statements, which was based on studies that were, you know, done uh, maybe years ago. But all of the work that they do is based on position statements. So we have the affordable housing and homelessness solutions. We have the environmental issues and local government standing committees. Next slide, please. So our housing and homelessness is an incredibly active um, standing committee. Sherry Gondotano is a chair of that committee. Um, and you, uh, they're, they're, and all of our committees are always looking for new voices and new members uh, to work with them. And they are, because housing and homelessness, like in any community in the United States, is dealing with serious issues related to housing and homelessness. And the, these members are, they're meeting stakeholders and attending uh, workshops and participating in workshops on a weekly basis. And they're our representative. And so they see what's happening in our community. 
And that way they can come back and they can educate the members and they can edu edu educate residents in, uh, in our community about uh, you know, what is important to follow, which voices should we be following and, and supporting in our community. And so once again, they advocate based on league positions. So if you're interested, if you're interested in any of these standing committees, please put your name in the chat, your email, and we will get you connected to the chairs of these standing committees. Next slide, please. Our Environmental Issue Standing Committee, Amy Kompensteed is the chair. Again, a very active one. They were, uh, they spent, uh, a lot of time uh, coordinating the consensus process for the Shoreline Management Act study. Um, and they uh, also uh, are gonna start being very active supporting the lobby team, uh, environmental lobby team efforts uh, in this particular legislative session. They were also um, very active in when the City of Spokane Sustainability Action Plan was being uh, put together by many committees in Spokane. And this was the Spokane Sustainability Action Plan was approved by the city council and it's moving forward. There are lots of moving parts to it. And the Environmental Issues Committee uh, is once again, our eyes on this to help the membership understand where, what they should support, what actions they should support in our community. So if you're interested, once again, put your name in the uh, chat box and we'll get you connected to Amy. And then uh, next slide. Our third standing committee uh, is local government and that is chaired by Ann Murphy. And uh, this is just, once again, really excited. I think at the very beginning uh, when we, we were chatting amongst ourselves, we are talking about the new county government where it went from three to five uh, uh, county uh, representatives. And so the, there's lots of action gonna be happening there. And one of the main issues here that the local government is looking at is working with the Smart Justice Spokane campaign against the new jail. Um, so that's, uh, it's going to be, uh, local government is, um, we need all the help we can get and all the voices we can get to help us on the local government, uh, standing committee. So, uh, please speak up if you are, you want to join that next slide, please. So what can you do? You can join our standing committees. Uh, and so in the CNMB, and then if you're also interested in voter services, like you saw everything under voter services. So if that is an area that you would be interested in, please do let us know. Uh, review all of these position statements at, the, our, at our local, state, and national level. They're all posted on the websites, easily found, um, especially if you have a burning desire or a specific issue that you would like the league to study, then uh, yes, you can. Uh, sometimes a single voice can make a huge difference uh, long-term too. Uh, current legislative session, uh, weekly legislative newsletters, be sure and read those in detail and respond. They make it so easy for all league members to make our voices heard. And familiarize yourself with Ledge at Wadaga. That is just a giggle to get in there. I mean, it's not, I mean, it's very serious, but it's really interesting. So go to that. You can track bills, find out who, uh, who, who sponsors them, who supports them, who doesn't, where it is in the legislative process. So if you're interested in anything uh, that the legislative uh, session is looking at, please do look at that and renew your membership. We need all the voices and we need the support. So uh, we can make a difference. We have been making, the league has been making fabulous uh, differences in our region, state and nation. Um, and we're well respected. It's a great organization to belong to. And with that, are the, if there, if we can open it up for any questions that we might have. I think we're, uh, we have a little there bit is, of time. There is a question, Sylvia, in the chat from Katie. Katie has a question. She wants to know, can I testify and list my membership, but not represent LWB, or do I need permission? And there's a second part to that. Is someone testifying in Olympia? Oh, 
well, I, I, I uh, certainly know that people are testifying in Olympia. Um, and and Anne, um, Anne just posted in the chat about the lobby team. So that was helpful. Thank you, Anne. Oh, great. Yeah, that because Anne said that she testified on Monday. <laughs> So, uh, and she's part of the lobby team. So she she did and represented the league. And so there are that uh, anybody can, um, let's say, go to a city council meeting, and they can say, "I support the league's position," and but they cannot speak for the league. If you want, you have to get board approval to be able to speak for the league, and typically. The person that speaks for the leave is either leadership or the president, unless they appoint somebody to speak in their stead. So it's it's really important to um, to understand that you cannot speak for the league unless you have received specific approval from the board. And uh, once again, typically it is the president that speaks for the league. Oh, but I'm asking. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, oh, go ahead. I see your hand up. I know. I didn't realize that I was off mute because I was getting frustrated. Because I, I know what you're, I know okay. what you're saying. What I'm asking is like, so I am testifying, but for the ARC and some other, but part of that is listing my memberships, right? So I am a member of the NAACP. I am a member of the League of Women Voters. Like that's what I'm asking. Am I allowed to attach my membership as part of my wider resume? Oh yeah. I mean, I. I Unless I'm mistaken, if I'm mistaken, please somebody join in and say, no, Sylvia, that's not right. But I don't think that there's any, you know, as long as you don't speak in the name of the league without permission, I think that that's fine to put your membership down. Perfect. Uh, please, Thank you. That's please, right. please see Lunell's note. And I think she just raised her hand. Go ahead, yes. Lunell. You're on mute if you're talking. Maybe you can't, maybe she can't unmute. Sorry. Um, you can't, if somebody says, what organizations do you belong to as a requirement of testifying, you can include that. But you do not say, I am Lunell Hot, a member of the League of Women Voters, any more than you would say, I'm Lunell Hot and I'm. 25 years old, or I'm Lunell Hot and I'm a member of Rotary. Because you would be surprised at how many silly wheels we have who uh, give the impression that they're speaking for the league because they're a member. We have 2,400 members who, um, who just can't do that because it's just too difficult uh, and too confusing for the public. So. I want to just double down on what Sylvia and Ann are saying is just say, I'm Lunell Hot and I agree with the league position on XYZ, or I'm Lunell Hot and I disagree with Representative so and so's argument, that sort of thing. But just go as a private citizen. Okay, are there any other questions with the program planning process? I guess if not, we can move on to the second part of the program. Okay, so I see Deanne on the call. Deanne, are you going to be presenting tonight for the state? Hi, no, I'm not. I'm a co-chair along with Dolores Irwin, but another okay. member of our committee, Sally Carpenter-Hale, is going to do the um, bulk of the narrative and she will be assisted by Joanne Lasowski. We have a couple other members here too, um, as resource people. So I'm trying to find Sally Hale to make her a co-host so she can share her screen and I'm not seeing it on here. Um, I'm, I'm missing it somehow. She is here. Uh, I'm here. There she is. <laughs> okay, let me see. I'm just missing it. There's, um, hold on, bear with me here. We need Joanne Lasowski <laughs> to be a co-host. She's gonna be doing I don't. Is Joanne going to be doing the near uh, the screen? Okay, never mind. Sally is. No, I got oh, it. Looks like she's already got it. Okay, wonderful. Um, I did want to 
I did want to mention, though, we have um, who are other members of our committee who are here today. Um, uh, is Carol Rickert, Rickert, who is from the Tacoma Pierce League. Lauren Snyder, I believe, is here. She is from the King County League. And Lynn Whitley, who is from the Island County League. Um, we have 10 members who um, were part of this uh, committee, and uh, we worked diligently for more than two years, and we are pleased to have completed it and are happy to serve as resource people when local leagues are getting ready to uh, do their consensus work and are looking forward to getting the, that feedback from them all in, um, I think it's March 20th, it's, it's due about, about March 20th. So thank you for this opportunity. And um, we like to reference this as almost a, a Cliff Notes version of the report. We acknowledge the report is lengthy. Um, we think it's pretty easy to read because it's written in what's called a um, long form journalism. Um, so it reads like a very long magazine article um, where we try to humanize it in many ways. It is objective, um, it's uh, well cited and it's you know, well attributed. Um, and we think it's pretty comp comprehensive, although we're continuing to um, turn up new information um, because this, this uh, um, uh, situation is changing daily. And um, I think Sally will make a mention of that, uh, a, a bit of information we have about uh, a committee in Olympia, that's a Senate committee that's taking up a measure related to this topic here later this week. So I'll stop and um, Sally, I think, are you ready to go? I'm ready to go. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, here we go. As uh, Thank you for inviting us to share the highlights of our study. And uh, as Deanne mentioned, we are a committee of 10 league members from throughout the state. We began looking at the impact of the decline of local news on Washington two years ago, starting as an affinity study group. Then in June, 2021, Delegates to the state convention approved our proposal for a statewide study. And on November 14th, the state board approved the study. So the next step is for local leagues to address the consensus questions early this year. With that in mind, we'd like to share with you what we learned. Please save your questions until the end of the presentation and we will be happy to answer them then. In Washington, Newspaper circulation is down 43% since 2004. The state has lost 20% of its newspapers. And the decline in local newsroom staffing means diminished coverage that has left communities without vital information. This decline has negative consequences. Robust local news from government coverage to public health information helps provide the glue that holds communities together. Reduced local news coverage results in fewer people voting and running for office. They are less plugged into their communities and political polarization grows. Accurate public health information is harder to obtain and government costs more when elected officials don't have reporters looking over their shoulders. The situation in Washington mirrors what is happening nationwide. The United States has lost a quarter of our local newspapers since the start of the decline. If a community has no newspaper at all, it is known as a news desert. Those are the counties in red on this map. The counties in yellow have only one newspaper. If this trend continues, we could lose one of every three papers by 2025. Yet 70% of people aren't aware of this decline. Let's pause and explain how we define a newspaper. We recognize that more people prefer to read the news online and that more news organizations are cutting back on print publication. So we consider a newspaper any publication, whether in print, online, or a combination of the two, that provides continuing, comprehensive, and accountable reporting of a community's people, government agencies, schools, and activities. This quote from the editor of the Spokane Spokesman Review explains this thinking nicely. 
Which brings us to the question, why study local newspapers and not TV or radio? Local TV does not provide the same in-depth day-to-day reporting of city and county councils and school boards as newspapers do. In fact, stations often will use a newspaper story as the basis for their own story. We reviewed all the weekly and daily newspapers in Washington, comparing those published in 2004 with those published now. We noted which ones closed or stopped publishing in print and whether they had new owners or circulation changes. For example, King County lost 11 newspapers and Snohomish County lost nine. We also looked at how many newspapers were produced in each county. We learned Washington has 13 counties out of 39 where only a single newspaper is produced. A Soton County has no newspaper although it gets some coverage from a paper across the state line in Idaho. Here are the five newspapers in Spokane County and their circulations in 2004 and 2020. Overall, the papers lost 62% of their circulation during this period. Meanwhile, the county's population grew by 12% between 2010 and 2020. At the Spokesman Review, the only daily newspaper in the county, circulation declined 43%. The other four papers in the county are weeklies. Two of them saw dramatic circulation losses. The Cheney Free Press lost 92% of its circulation, while the Spokane Valley News Herald was down 50%. The other two weeklies actually saw modest circulation gains. The Deer Park Tribune was up 14% and the Pacific Northwest Inlander gained 16%. While many newspapers have closed, others continue to publish, but in a much reduced form. Here's a look at four in Washington. Note that while page counts have declined, the cost of buying a paper has increased for all of them. In Tacoma, the News Tribune publishes nearly two-thirds fewer pages, but charges double for them. In Bellingham and Ellensburg, fewer than half the number of pages, but twice the cost. And in Spokane, more than 25% fewer pages, but a price that's a third more. Papers that continue to publish, but have very little content of substance, are known as ghost newspapers. One example is the News Tribune in Tacoma. It once was a highly regarded paper that was purchased by a hedge fund during a bankruptcy sale. The hedge fund, Chatham Asset, Ma Asset Management, bought five other Washington newspapers, four of which have also seen reduced circulation and staffing. The experience in Tacoma gives us a picture of how the decline has resulted in dramatically uneven coverage for communities. Tacoma is the third most populous city in the state with nearly a quarter of a million people. Yakima is considerably smaller with a population of fewer than 100,000, but the newsroom staffs are nearly identical in size. Think about that. How does such a small news staff cover a community that is more than double in size? We were particularly interested in how the decline has affected government coverage. In some states, more reporters are covering state government now, but not Washington, where the news staff has been cut by more than half. Here's a photo of the Capitol Bureau in Olympia two decades ago. 16 full and part-time journalists. Today, we have only five full-time journalists assigned by established news outlets. This quote from Paul Query, the AP's former state editor, describes the situation. It's not just at the state level that government agencies and officials aren't getting enough coverage. Throughout the state, newspapers don't have the staff to continue covering scores and scores of city councils, county councils, county commissions, special districts, and school districts. 
The Seattle Times and Everett Herald eliminated their outlying news bureaus, which severely curtailed and in some cases eliminated suburban government coverage. Reporting and editing are labor intensive. Despite reports about artificial intelligence that can report and write, not many people anticipate it replacing human journalists. So job losses equate directly to less coverage of communities. Compared to the nation as a whole, Washington has experienced larger staffing declines, 67% versus 50%. Not long ago, no one initially filed to run for mayor in Gig Harbor, which lost local news coverage until the nonprofit online paper Gig Harbor Now came on the scene. Likewise, in Bellingham, where the Bellingham Herald has reduced its coverage, incumbents had no opponents in several races a few years ago. So we were not surprised when we read a study that looked at 11 communities in California it found that mayoral races were closer and had more candidates in communities where newspapers had more reporters and editors. Washington State University professor Travis Rideout says less information leads people to lose interest in government. There's also a link between local newspaper declines and voter turnout. The Seattle Times looked at voter turnout in the 2021 general election. In Yakima County, turnout was an abysmal 32%, the second worst among Washington's 39 counties. And in Franklin County, where the Tri-City Herald slashed its newsroom, turnout was just 29%. We did a study of our own, reviewing turnout in February special elections in every county in Washington. We reasoned that turnout in an election for a school or fire bond or levy might measure civic engagement and involvement more accurately than the turnout in a heavily publicized election. In all but one of Washington's 39 counties, voter turnout decreased from 2008 to 2020. In some counties, the decrease was significant, nearly 13% in Asotin County and more than 11% in Benton County, for example. No newspaper is published in Asotin County although the area is served by the Lewiston Tribune. When we looked at the impact of the decline on civic engagement, we found a great resource pretty close to home. Portland State University professor Lee Shaker focused on the closure of the Seattle Post Intelligencer's print edition in 2009. Using data from the US Census, he defined measures of civic engagement. Shaker said after the 146-year-old post-intelligencer stopped printing, he tracked declines in two areas, in people demonstrating their political and social values by buying or boycotting services or products, and in participation in community groups and organizations. Shaker said a ghost newspaper can be more problematic than no newspaper because seeing a newspaper makes people think they'll be informed about things such as problems with their drinking water. National studies connect the dots between local newspaper declines and greater political partisanship. Washington State University professor Benjamin Shores says that's because national coverage is conflict driven while local coverage is more community driven. If you don't have a local newspaper, there's no place where you can write a civil letter to the editor. So people more often repost memes about national political figures. Local media is a major source of information about disease outbreaks, both for readers and public health officials. Officials rely on newspapers to alert residents to what's happening in their communities and to inform them about how to maintain and improve their well being. At the same time, public health officials rely on local newspapers to track people's activities and behaviors. 
In Kittitas County, the public health officer learned about a potentially dangerous situation, an indoor memorial service for an elderly couple in the middle of the COVID pandemic. When Dr. Mark Larson read about the upcoming event, he was able to contact organizers and recommend preventive actions to keep people safer. All of the public health officials we talked with warned about the dangers of people relying on social media for their health information. When newspapers close, it costs more to run local government. Without reporters watching local officials, government tends to expand with more employees and higher wages, increased county deficits and higher tax revenues. That results in higher borrowing costs for cities and counties. Building a hospital or a school can cost as much as 11% more after a newspaper closure. That extra cost can mean hundreds of thousands of dollars of additional interest at taxpayer expense. State Treasurer Mike Pellicciotti believes journalists' role as public watchdogs is paramount. Attorney General Bob Ferguson is concerned about how the local news decline affects government accountability and oversight. He read a story about Motel 6 in Arizona sharing guest information with federal immigration officers and wondered if the same thing was happening in Washington. He launched a civil rights and consumer protection investigation that led to a $12 million settlement. Ferguson has led an effort among other state attorneys general to support federal legislation for tax credits for local news. There are many causes for the decline. Newspaper re advertising revenue has fallen dramatically as advertisers have discovered how much less expensive online advertising can be. Once, 80% of the spokesman reviews revenue came from advertising. Today, the paper receives only 35% of its revenue from advertising. And subscriptions, which have also declined, don't bring in enough to cover the costs. Big tech has been a major player in this trend. In a Commerce Committee report, U.S. Senator Maria Cantwell accused large platforms that post links to local news stories, such as Google and Facebook, of being unfair and deceptive and engaging in abusive practices. Those two platforms account for 75% of the digital advertising revenue in local markets. In the wake of the decline, people's reliance on social media as a news source has skyrocketed. The report takes a look at this, taking care to discuss the problems social media generates, including its lack of oversight and the frequency of it being a significant source of mis- and disinformation. One Twitter study by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology indicated false news on that platform is on average about 70% more likely to be retweeted than information that faithfully reports actual events. We also report on the benefits of social media and how in some locations, it is the primary vehicle for distributing information people need. That's the case in Kittitas County where more people subscribe to a community Facebook page than to the local newspaper, the Ellensburg Daily Record. For their part, newspapers were slow to adapt to readers' growing preference for online. Many have failed to provide in-depth reporting on major issues. Readers complain their local paper is expensive, boring, and too political. However, the future is not necessarily all doom and gloom. Legislation has been introduced at the federal and state levels that offers a variety of proposed remedies. Some state laws have passed and are making a difference. More and more nonprofit news operations are starting up with financing from grants and readers. Support remains strong for newspapers that serve communities of color. 
and some communities are stepping up to raise funds for their local papers. Several legislative solutions have been proposed. Washington legislators this year will reconsider continuing a small BNO tax credit for newspaper publishers that we've had since 2009. The proposal didn't get out of committee last year after the sponsor said people on both sides of the aisle were opposed. Opponents of the bill questioned whether government has a role in supporting private business, but many companies benefit from government support. Washington aerospace manufacturers have received preferential tax rate reductions that total more than $90 million. Other aerospace companies receive tax credits totaling nearly $100 million. The bill is being reintroduced this session at the request of Attorney General Bob Ferguson, and a public hearing will take place Thursday morning in a Senate committee. The new bill clearly reflects information from our study about the decline and its impact. Nonprofit news organizations in Washington, including Gig Harbor Now and The Jolt in Olympia, are doing a thorough job covering local government. These eight nonprofits in the state are all either online only or a hybrid of print and online. Loyal readers have helped keep afloat newspapers that serve communities of color in Washington. And an increasing number of papers are turning to their communities for tax deductible support. For example, the Columbian in Southwest Washington has raised more than a million dollars to hire three full-time reporters. The Seattle Times has paid for 27 positions in its 120 person newsroom through community giving. Not all these efforts have been as successful. In Tacoma, only 88 donors contributed to a fundraising campaign that fell flat. So the question remains, are these few bright spots sustainable? In fact, there are serious doubts as to whether these strategies will sustain the increasingly fragile local news business. It's not a journalism problem, it is a democracy problem. Historians point to long support for newspapers even before we became a nation. Our founders established protections for the press in the US Constitution. We already have postal subsidies for news publications, along with government financed public television and radio and legal protections for the press. As President Thomas Jefferson said, a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. For this work, we conducted more than 50 interviews and consulted more than 500 reports, articles, and studies. We prepared it in a different way from many league studies. We used an approach known as long form journalism, making it read more like a lengthy magazine article. We believe this more conversational style and structure makes for a more, more enjoyable and informative read. We also created distinct sections the main narrative, and another section we titled A Deeper Dive, where we feature more comprehensive stories about single topics. We also have a clip note style outline that we believe members will find useful when they meet to discuss the report. We appreciate your time and we'd be pleased to answer your questions. Thank you, Sally. Are there any questions? Okay. Um, April, do you want to uh, facilitate the questions? I, I don't want to jump in here and take over. Oh, um, sure. Sylvia has her hand up. So, Sylvia, do you want to go ahead and ask a question? Sure. Um, so, I read the I read the study, and it, it was very well done. I I you know kudos to you and the amount of work that that took to put that together. It was just, it was amazing and very depressing. It was 
<laughs> really depressing. Um, and uh, so uh, I, my, I guess my question is on the consensus process um, and moving towards position statements. Um, so where are we in that process and the, what is the end goal of the committee as far as position statements? Do you, or can you speak to that? Um, I can say we have, we have our consensus questions. I think they're going to be shared um, after our all state um, briefing on January 21st. And I think we're trying to establish how readers or how members feel about whether the league itself should take a position in support of local news. I mean, I think we can say with objectively the our findings are that very much the study uh, points to the fact that they serve a public good, much like libraries and schools, um, and that they are linked very clearly with uh, successful democracy and successful healthy communities. Um, but I think it's up to the league to decide, you know, how we might support. We're not asking for support for specific legislation. We're just saying, hey, are local newspapers a public good of sorts? And should league have a role in advocating for their um, continued, you know, success? Okay, thank you. Okay, next, Gretchen has her hand up. Yeah, I had a couple of questions, actually. The one uh, you mentioned that I think it was when the hedge fund took over this one paper that the substance or the quality or something of the news declined. So how, how do you determine that? What's a kind of a good newspaper and what's one that isn't as informative or whatever uh, criteria you use? I'm going to ask um, if Dolores Irwin, who is a co-chair, if she would like to respond. She was really um, spot on about how we define a newspaper. She and Sally both had some uh, good research related to that. Dolores, do you mind? Um, I guess I, I would say that um, certainly what we address specifically are uh, are four impacts, which is on politics, government, healthcare, public finance. What else, am I missing something? So if a, um, primarily a lot of it would be the government coverage. So if your paper, I mean, and I can speak from experience and it's hard, it's harder for people who live in an area like Spokane or Seattle to really imagine what's gonna happen. But I can tell you, um, we in Kittitas County are watching our newspaper go down the drain. Um, we do have another newspaper that's in North County that only covers the north part of the county, which is Clee Ellum, Roslyn, those little cities up there. But um, our newspaper really has to be considered what they call, what we call in our study, a ghost newspaper, which means they're really not covering um, any governmental um, bodies, none. Now, what they will do, and which is they're doing more than some other newspapers are, which is that if they hear about a controversy, and this is usually after it's been passed, and that's another thing that a lot of people don't understand. In, in the old days when there used to be, when they talk about all these reporters, you might wonder, what were they all doing? You know, why do they need that much of a staff? And when you compare, let's say, Yakima with um, Tacoma, it's that they were covering, or, you know, we used to cover when I say we, I mean, you know, I was one of those reporters, um, you would be assigned a city or the county or, I mean, that was one of your primary areas of coverage, which would be school boards, special districts, transportation, um, the transportation uh, commission or whatever ran transportation. If you have an airport, um, all of those different agency school boards. Um, and that's not being done in a lot. Now it is in Spokane, I believe in, um, the by the spokesman review and it's being done in Seattle, but not in a lot, obviously not in Tacoma because you have to have, because reporting takes um, labor. It takes people to go and get the information. You know, even if they're watching something online, if they're watching the streaming 
council meeting, but that is not happening in, uh, no, it's not hop happening in our county. So like I said, we only find out after the fact, like if something's passed and there's people complaining in the community, then they will go back and do a story about it. Our, our paper will do that. But so, so um, and, and unfortunately, those are the topics that a lot of people find boring when they, you know, and that's why circulation is dropping because it, it's not interesting to them, but ultimately it hits you in those, certainly those four ways that we've outlined, which is community involvement. You don't know what's happening in the community. Fewer people run for office, your voter turnout drops. I mean, we all know what happens when voter turnout drops. So anyway, so a certain thing, looking for consistent day in and day out coverage of agencies and organizations that impact our lives. It's not just about the weather. It's not just about the car accident on the highway. It's not just about a stabbing. It's not just about a football game, but it's consistent reg regular coverage. It doesn't have to be daily coverage and it could be an online news, news operation that we call a newspaper, but it's that consistent reporting of decision makers whose decisions impact our lives directly. And a lot, some of the weeklies are doing a really good job of, of coverage. So it, it doesn't have to be done daily. And another thing is a lot of people think that the ones who depend, people who depend on social media, um, a lot of social media issues are covered by agencies that will issue press releases. And one thing you have to remember and when you rely on social media, which actually usually doesn't have much local coverage, but you potentially could get, like for example, our county commissioners hired a public information officer. And all I can say is, and this is completely understandable. I used to be a public information officer for a city, by the way. And you know, I just remember once I held that position that it, you really kind of, or I did, breathed a sigh of relief because you realize you are not going to have some editor looking over your shoulder over every fact that you put in the story. And that's literally what happens when you're a reporter. Someone's looking over every single thing that you're writing on there because there's, you know, at least one editor, your direct editor, and then his editor. Um, and what you're depending on then is that your county commissioners are using their public information officer to put out information. And you can bet that that um, press release is not going to have certain facts that they would rather not be publicized or they're going to put it, they'll either leave it out completely or they will spin it, you know, which is just human nature. So before we go to the next person, we have Christine up with her hand, uh, Christine with her hand up next, but I wanna ask that, I did see on that last slide contact information if you had more questions. And I did post a link to the WASH LWVWA journalism study in the chat, but if you can post your contact information in the chat, if people have follow-up questions that we don't get to before the end of the, uh, before the seven o'clock cutoff. So, um, Christine, were you ready with your question? Um, you're muted or you put your hand down. So maybe you don't have a question anymore. I want to bring up that someone did make a comment about um, pink slime on page 37 of the report that sort of answers um, Gretchen's question about what we think of news. Thank you. And what I had, um, so I wanted to just bounce in here. This is Anne in terms of Deanne and Dolores. I know that there is a national, uh, uh, a big website that grades papers on where they are in terms of their uh, right or left or central or whatever. Was that any, I don't, I think maybe that's getting at what Gretchen was asking. I don't know, Gretchen, but did you, uh, is there anything like that and connected with Washington newspapers that you were able to uh, jump into? Uh, we're, we don't look at uh, bias in the in okay. in, in our reporting um, because and and those are national papers. We're looking at just how they produce regular where the the state papers in Washington State whether they produce regular consistent coverage right. of communities. So, so there's no tool. For, there's no tool for that at the at our lower lower level. Well, so, there's we do not have a tool for bias, and, and we didn't really cover bias 
because of the fact that we're really focusing on the four impacts. But one of the things we do have is, um, and, it, and it's not to do with bias, I don't think, but we there's a check sheet that was created by Penny Abernathy and she has a gigantic website that has all kinds of, you know, covers, you know, even more than we do. But if you want to see if you, um, if a particular paper that you know of, you know, not if the Spokane review is not one of those, but if you know of a paper or people in communities who want to know if they've essentially got a ghost newspaper, um, there's a little survey and it shows um, you can make little checkoff marks. So you take this, um, not a survey, but um, just a check sheet on, and in essence, it's what a newspaper should be covering, one that uh, has good coverage if it if you if there's a lot of blanks on that check sheet then you know you have a newspaper with a problem that's not giving you the information that you need christine i do see that you have your hand up were you able to get off mute yes i was able to get off mute thanks okay. um i've been a member of league of women voters since the 1980s um but recently um enjoying the adventures on the internet I found a online newspaper in Spokane called rangemedia.co, C-O. So I wish, wish you would look at that one as another online publication mm -hmm. that um, is pretty much concentrating on the city of Spokane. I live in Deer Park. I live in the seventh legislative district, which now covers two congressional districts. Um, but um, it's fresh news and uh it i can't believe it it took a hundred uh, it took a year to get a hundred subscribers so that's my comment thank you thanks christine okay sylvia you're next muted here um so we would like to be part of the consensus process i mean i'm just saying that personally i mean i would love to have our league have a group that's part of a consensus process. I think it's important for us to, to, to do this, to learn about it, to see how it's done. And then this is a great study. It's a fabulous study. Everybody is familiar with newspapers. Everybody's read a newspaper. People are concerned about the decline of newspapers, but I don't think anybody realizes what the, the, the downstream impacts of that are that you articulated so well in this report. So if anybody is interested in the consensus process, can you please put your name in the chat so that we can, because it's gonna be hard for us to, to reach out to other people to see who might be interested in the consensus process. So if and, you could do that, that would be fabulous. And we are happy to serve as resources when you do have your consensus meeting, uh, discussion meetings. And in fact, we're already on tap to do a, two or three of those here coming up not too, uh, in not too many weeks. Um, and 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 again, you know, we're happy if just email me. I put my uh, contact information in the chat. Uh, I did want to point out, for instance, now we are we are interested in the fact that the a state uh, senate committee is discussing uh, a BNO tax preference uh, bill renewal this Thursday, because league has not taken a position on on whether we want to support. Uh, support for new local newspapers we won't be testifying in terms of you know a league position we have to wait until everybody you know weighs in and discusses and and shares their uh, impressions of our findings um so things are changing and i guess that's i just want to call your attention to the fact that you know this is a, a moving target and we do really um appreciate your support for i think a very important topic thanks Dan. So we're down to our last two minutes. We got two more hands up. So if we don't end up getting to your question, please reach out to Deanne, her, her information's in there. There's also the web link to the LWVWA with information um, and contact there as well. So please make note of both of those. And then I'll call on Jeet. Um, Sylvia, could you compare for those of us who were involved in the general meeting a few months ago regarding the shoreline study? how that compares with the consensus process we're referring to here? Well, I think that, that it would be. I mean, we would have people read the study and then 
uh, and then answer consensus questions. So there, yeah. there are a couple of meetings coming up at the state, right? On January 21st is one of them. And so is that correct or? We will be presenting this information again at the January 21 meeting. It's, it's for anybody who hasn't been able to attend one of these local presentations. I think we've done a half dozen of them so far. And so um, we established that. And then there are going to be a couple of train the um, consensus facilitator meetings coming up and that's all on the member page about this study. Mary Great. Coltrane has been taking the lead on that. Great. Does that answer your question, Jean? I think so, um, yeah. Okay, so it's seven o'clock. If you need to drop, we wanna respect your time um, because this is the end of our meeting. I do see we have a couple hands in the air. I'm not sure if our, um, Visitors from state can stay on just a little bit longer to answer a couple more questions. Um, if you can, that would be great. I can stay on a little bit longer, yes. And and we have uh, other members of our committee here who I think that can as well. Okay, wonderful. And to all who have to drop, thank you for coming. This was a really good meeting. I really appreciate you. you all being here. Thank you so much. Okay, so we have Lynn, your hands up. I just want to ask, have you shared any of this with the newspapers in your local areas, the study that you've done? Uh, yes, we have. And um, we've picked up interest from the uh, Washington Newspaper Publishers Association. Um, we did have actually one of our technical reviewers was Briar Dudley, who is um, the free press editor at the Seattle Times. Um, and they've appreciated the, the efforts. I know in Mason County, um, a longtime editor is um, weighing in on this. And then Dolores, you can speak to what's happened. Ellensburg, you've got um, the retiring managing editor. Right, oh, he's retired for, and I already told you about our newspaper, the Daily Record, and the fact that he resigned is just more evidence that we know the paper it, you know, it's just a matter of time before it goes down. And the Daily Record is owned by um, a corporation that has several newspapers, but, and I don't know what's happening with the rest of them, but it's not going well because they're, you know, um, well, and I don't know how much he'll actually tell us about resigning from the Daily Record because I don't know what he's going on to his next step. So he might not want to be that forthcoming, but, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see. We'll try to get out of it whatever we can. And Briar will also be talking about, and we're going to go a little step further. On most of these meetings, we're really concentrating on um, working toward, you know, on toward the consensus uh, thing, but we're going to go a little uh, more wide ranging and talk about potential solutions. And that actually is a kind of a depressing subject itself. But I mean, you know, um, there's a lot of different ideas floating out there. It, the more um, publicity there is about this topic, and there really has been just since the time we started um, this study until now, there's been many, many more articles. But gosh, I, I mean, I'm kind of glad that we did, we read 500 as it was, but I mean, they're constantly coming out now. So the more publicity, the more press about it, then the more attention and the more people um, coming up with ideas and, you know, maybe there will be a solution. I don't know. Well, okay. I wanted to say it's a tricky what, you know, what the solution or solutions might be is very tricky. You know, there are yeah. plenty of people in the newspaper business who say, yeah, we should get government support in the form of tax credits, or maybe um, uh, legislation should allow newspapers to join together to negotiate with Google and um, and Facebook so they can't take all of our content and then make money on the ads that they run next to the content they take from our papers. You know, and then there are people who say, journalists who say, no, we don't want any government involvement because that will lead eventually to censorship. Um, so there's there's a whole range of um, discussion and debate, and it's it's very heated, and it's not these are not going to be easy things to solve. And and I have a short comment to make that the news media waits for a story to break. The breaking part of this story will be when the league adopts a position on this situation. Oh, that's good to know. All right, Carol, you're up. 
I have a quick question about the process because in the past when we've had a consensus um, or participated at the local level in a state consensus, we've done it as a total league. Are we gonna do it just with the group that have signed up to be part of the process? Or is there gonna be a general meeting where we develop a consensus for this whole, whole Spokane League? I think you're addressing the Spokane people, aren't you? Yes. 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 And also you're in here on what is going on in other well, I know I know a number of different local leagues are planning the consensus process. Then their responses to the the consensus questions will go back to the board and to our committee, where we, I think, with the board's assistant, will develop a policy based on what all of the locals are telling us that they believe and would support. And then, as I understand it, that goes to the board, which may approve the um, the draft and then eventually it will be um discussed and decided on at the state convention in may um i think lunella is still on the line and she can probably um answer with greater insight than than me oh and Anne is weighing in here you muted so while I was typing, I didn't pay attention to what all you said, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's why I can't do the chat and, and follow along. I cannot do that. But, you know, I but can to Carol's it. point, I mean, the opportunity has in the past always been available to every member. And I think that's the intent of the league. And the uh, the consensus as it's combined will go to the state board and they can adopt the position before convention if there is a position to be adopted. Um, and then at the convention, it is affirmed and then included in our program in action. So that's the process. Thanks, Ann. I guess my and I'm sorry if I jumped on Lunell. I don't know where you are, Lunell. Yeah, what's the role of the people I'm that were here? <laughs> the role of the people that signed up to be part of the consensus process? What's our role going to be? Uh, Sylvia, I think that's you. To Sylvia, respond. you need to speak to that. I'm just, I'm just, uh, just getting a general idea of what people would be, who would be interested. Uh, because if we don't have, if we have one person that's interested in doing the consensus process, it's not going to happen. Um, so it would be uh, we uh, we will have other people that that will go. I mean, I I will commit to do the training for the consensus process to help with that. But we just need people to participate in the consensus process who have read the study, who will commit to read the study, and then they can actively par participate in the consensus process. So coming to a meeting, it could be a general meeting. We'll have to see our February. Uh, meeting is open at this point, but I don't know if that would give enough time for them to, um, for the state or for the uh, for the uh, people that are leading this to have us have the information that we would need. Our February meeting is February 14th. Well, and I want to point out that we purposely designed our study to be fairly reader friendly, despite its length. We have it in sections. We have a, 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 a section that's I think it's about five pages long of bullet points that summarizes each of the smaller sections they're, they're outlines of the findings in each of the smaller sections so it's kind of like a cheat sheet of answers to you know what what no not answers but that describe what our our study turned up yes it is it's very readable it's Thank you. It, yeah it is it's long it, it doesn't take long to um anyway and, and it's important it's, it's important so anyway so that's so uh, carol i hope that that answered your question so it would be just reading it and then participating in the consensus process okay did, did that answer your question carol uh yes okay arun i see your hand is up and i just want to let you know i posted in the chat a link to your question that you had asked about more information for the 21st meeting. I did put a link in the chat um, to that meeting. So, um, and then I'll go ahead and call on you. Sure. 
the question I had was uh, the link for 21st meeting, at least if we know the time, then we can hear the speakers directly if, uh, you know, possible. She said they're going to repeat the presentation, so I thought I'd ask. Yes, okay, yeah, I, I posted the link in the chat for you. For What's the that YouTube? You know, the YouTube. Oh, okay. I didn't, okay. I'll look and, for it, thank you. And okay. the present, there's a YouTube version of that presentation that we did to the Seattle League. It is on the um, League members website or the League website under members for the news study. There's a YouTube, so you could, you know, if you can't sleep one night, you can turn that on at 3 a.m. The State League, you need to be sure that it's the State League. It's on the State League website, yes. Joanne, you just posted that the link is to the Senate bill. Did I post the wrong link? Oh, oh no, no. Oh, you know okay. What happened? I, I, posted I posted that this is the link to the Senate bill in between the time that you posted your link. Mine's up one more. <laughs> <laughs> See, that? I'm up one more. <laughs> thank, you. thank you, Joy. I appreciate it. Thank you. Sorry. All right. So um, I don't know how much longer our speakers can stay on here because this is a hot topic. Oh, my. Um, very interesting. So do you have time for two more questions? Um, uh, how much do you want to keep going? I can do two more. How about, but my, uh, committee members, are they're well-versed on everything. So Dolores okay. and Sally and Joanne. All right. We have two left, Carol and Lunell with their hands up. We'll get through those two and then we'll call it a night. So go ahead, Carol. Hi, I just wanna say thank you so much for being interested enough to, to come to a meeting and listen to this and to read the work. Um, the members who wrote the report, I was not part of the writing. I was, <laughs> I'm the daughter retrieval bloodhound. So that was my role. And um, yes, <laughs> I love Donna. Um, but so thank you for giving me a reference to that new newspaper. Um, I want to tell you what a ghosted newspaper looks like when it sits on your kitchen table. Because the News Tribune that Joanne and I read in an ever diminishing hope of seeing a report on a city council meeting, this morning's paper the news section, this means national, state, county, city, was six pages. There was one locally written journalist article, one in those six pages. The majority of articles were on police reported crime in Pierce County, and they're coming from AP Wire Services or they're coming from Seattle Times. They are not even locally produced when it reports local crime. On the other hand, the sports section is 12 pages. <laughs> this is what we're dealing with in Tacoma and you in Spokane, I looked at your newspaper and yeah, there was some decline between 2004 and 2020. You are so lucky with the Spokesman Review. And I envy you and I'm delighted for you that you have that. So thank you, ladies. Thanks, Carol. Appreciate that. Okay, Luna, last but never least. Oh, uh and I just wanted to point out some things that were not included in the scope of this study, two of them that relate, well, three that relate to the league. And I did put in the chat how important the observer function is of our members when they show up time and time again at these meetings, because that's what the newspapers can't hire people to do the way the league can. And Spokane has done a wonderful job being at city and at school boards and that sort of thing. So that's a great thing. The other thing is with these wonderful reporters who start their own online um, publications, they don't have the corporate background so that when something bad happens, they can't just have their lawyer do something and something bad will happen. So they don't have the backing that I can't believe I'm saying this, a large corporation such as the spokesperson review has, and it makes a huge difference. 
The other thing is I'm on the Washington Coalition for Open Government Board, and we are at our wits end because the Public Records Act is something that used to be sacred in the state of Washington, and it no longer is. And that's being infringed upon on a regular basis. We just had three incidents in the state legislature now. And without lawyers and journalists to tackle this stuff, the public simply won't know. And it's just too hard to get to. So that's my, you know, bang the drum um, on this. And I really want to thank the study committee, which has done a great job on this and for other people's attention. Too. Good job. Thank you so much for letting me come. Thank you so much, ladies, for, for coming. This has been just fabulous. Um, I do I do believe we already talked about the consensus questions, but Jean has a question about the consensus process already been written, the questions. And I do remember Deanne talking about that already, but did you say when that they're going to be available? Um, I believe they will be posted after our January 21 meeting. Okay. Um, All right. And the, I know it's not a lot of time, but um, then I believe the consensus responses are supposed to be returned to the state board around March 20. And then we have like two weeks to work with the state board to devise a, a position or write up a position for their approval or with their approval. So it's tight. It's a busy spring. Okay. I want to all thank right. you all for your interest. And a number of us have backgrounds in journalism and, and, and really feel strongly about this, but it's not just because we're former journalists. We do see the impact and the importance of, of local news to the health of a community and to our democracy. That was a quote from Benjamin Shores. It's not a journalism problem, it's a democracy problem. Benjamin Shores is a professor at WSU there in uh, Pullman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been fabulous. Okay, bye-bye. So I'm gonna go ahead and say good night to everybody and thank you for participating. Thank you, Spokane League. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.